Section 8 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Goad. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Introductory to the Paradise of Children. The golden days of October passed away, as so many other Octobers have, and brown November likewise, and the greater part of chill December too. At last came Merry Christmas, and Eustace fried along with it, making it all the merrier by his presence, and the day after his arrival from college there came a mighty snowstorm. Up to this point the winter had held back, and had given us a good many mild days, which were like smiles upon its wrinkled visage. The grass had kept itself green, in sheltered places such as the nooks of southern hill slopes, and along the lee of the stone fences. It was but a week or two ago, and since the beginning of the month, that the children had found a dandelion in bloom on the margin of Snowbrook, where it glides out of the dell. But no more green grass and dandelions now. This was such a snowstorm. Twenty miles of it might have been visible at once, between the windows of Tanglewood and the dome of Taconic, had it been possible to see so far among the eddying drifts that whitened all the atmosphere. It seemed as if the hills were giants and were flinging monstrous handfuls of snow at one another in their enormous sport. So thick were the fluttering snowflakes that even the trees, midway down the valley, were hidden by them the greater part of the time. Sometimes, it is true, the little prisoners of Tanglewood could discern a dim outline of Monument Mountain, and the smooth whiteness of the frozen lake at its base, and the black or gray tracts of woodland in the nearer landscape, but these were merely peeps through the tempest. Nevertheless, the children rejoiced greatly in the snowstorm. They had already made acquaintance with it by tumbling heels overhead into the highest drifts and flinging snow at one another, as we had just fancied the Berkshire Mountains to be doing. And now they had come back to their spacious playroom, which was big as the great drawing room, and was lumbered with all sorts of playthings, large and small. The biggest was a rocking horse that looked like a real pony, and there was a whole family of wooden, waxen, plaster, and china dolls, besides rag babies, and blocks enough to build Bunker Hill Monument, and nine pins and balls, and humming tops and battle doors, and gray sticks and skipping ropes, and more of such valuable property than I could tell of in a printed page. But the children liked the snowstorm better than them all. It suggested so many brisk enjoyments for tomorrow, and all the remainder of the winter. The sleigh ride, the slides down the hill into the valley, the snow images that were to be shaped out, the snow fortresses that were to be built, and the snowballing to be carried on. So the little folks blessed the snowstorm and were glad to see it come thicker and thicker and watched hopefully the long drift that was piling itself up in the avenue and was already higher than any of their heads. Why, we shall be blocked up till spring, cried they, with the hugest delight. What a pity that the house is too high to be quite covered up. The little red house down yonder will be buried up to its eaves. You silly children, what do you want of more snow, asked Eustace, who, tired of some novel that he was skimming through, had strolled into the playroom. It has done mischief enough already by spoiling the only skating that I could hope for through the winter. We shall see nothing more of the lake till April, and this was to have been my first day upon it. Don't you pity me, Primrose? Oh, to be sure, answered Primrose, laughing. But for your comfort, we will listen to another of your old stories, such as you told us under the porch and down in the hollow, by Shatterbrook. Perhaps I shall like them better now, when there is nothing to do, than while there were nuts to be gathered and beautiful weather to enjoy. Hereupon, Periwinkle, Clover, Sweet Fern, and as many other of the little fraternity and cousinhood as were still at Tanglewood, gathered about Eustace, and earnestly besought him for a story. The student yawned, stretched himself, and then, to the vast admiration of the small people, skipped three times back and forth over the top of the chair, in order, as he explained to them, to set his wits in motion. Well, well, children, said he, after these preliminaries, since you insist and Primrose has set her heart upon it, I will see what can be done for you, and that you may know what happy days there were before snowstorms came into fashion. I will tell you a story of the oldest of all the old times, when the world was as new as the sweet fern's brand new humming pot. There was then but one season of the year, and that was the delightful summer, and but one age for mortals, and that was childhood. I never heard of that before, said Primrose. Of course you never did, answered Eustace. It shall be a story of what nobody but myself ever dreamt of, a paradise of children, and how. 
By the naughtiness of just such a little imp as Primrose here, it all came to nothing. So Eustace Bright sat down in the chair which had just been skipping over, took cowslip upon his knee, ordered silence throughout the auditory, and began a story about a sad, naughty child, whose name is Pandora, and about her play fellow, Epimetheus. You may read it word for word in the pages that come next. This is the end of section 8. Section 9 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Paradise of Children. Long, long ago, when this old world was in its tender infancy, there was a child named Epimetheus who never had either father or mother, and that he might not be lonely, another child, fatherless and motherless like himself, was sent from a far country to live with him and be his playfellow and helpmate. Her name was Pandora. The first thing that Pandora saw when she entered the cottage where Epimetheus dwelt was a great box, and almost the first question which she put to him after crossing the threshold was this. Epimetheus, what have you put in that box? My dear little Pandora, answered Epimetheus, that is a secret, and you must be kind enough not to ask any questions about it. The box was left here to be kept safely, and I do not myself know what it contains. But who gave it to you? asked Pandora, and where did it come from? That is a secret too, replied Epimetheus. How provoking! exclaimed Pandora, pouting her lip. I wish the great ugly box were out of the way. Oh, come, don't think of it any more, cried Epimetheus. Let us run out of doors and have some nice play with the other children. It is thousands of years since Epimetheus and Pandora were alive, and the world nowadays is a very different sort of thing from what it was in their time. Then everybody was a child. There needed no fathers and mothers to take care of the children, because there was no danger nor trouble of any kind, and no clothes to be mended, and there was always plenty to eat and drink. Whenever a child wanted his dinner, he found it growing on a tree, and if he looked at the tree in the morning, he could see the expanding blossom of that night's supper, or, at evening tide, he saw the tender bud of tomorrow's breakfast. It was a very pleasant life indeed. No labor to be done, no tasks to be studied, nothing but sports and dances, and sweet voices of children talking, or caroling like birds, or gushing out in merry laughter, throughout the live-long day. What was most wonderful of all, the children never quarreled among themselves. Neither had they any crying fits, nor, since time first began, had a single one of these little mortals ever gone apart into a corner, and sulked. Oh, what a good time was that to be alive in! The truth is, those ugly little winged monsters, called Troubles, which are now almost as numerous as mosquitoes, had never yet been seen on the earth. It is probable that the very greatest disquietude which a child had ever experienced was Pandora's vexation at not being able to discover the secret of the mysterious box. This was, at first, only the faint shadow of a trouble, but... Every day it grew more and more substantial, until, before a great while, the cottage of Epimetheus and Pandora was less sunshiny than those of the other children. Whence can the box have come? Pandora continually kept saying to herself and to Epimetheus, and what in the world can be inside of it? Always talking about this box, said Epimetheus at last, for he had grown extremely tired of the subject. I wish dear Pandora, you would try to talk of something else. Come, let us go and gather some ripe figs and eat them under the trees for our supper. And I know a vine that has the sweetest and juiciest grapes you ever tasted. Always talking about grapes and figs, cried Pandora pettishly. Well then, said Epimetheus, who was a very good-tempered child, like a multitude of children in those days, let us run out and have a merry time with our playmates. I am tired of merry times, and I don't care if I never have any more, answered our pettish little Pandora. 
and besides i never do have any this ugly box i am so taken up with thinking about it all the time i insist upon your telling me what is inside of it as i have already said fifty times over i do not know replied epimetheus getting a little vexed how then can i tell you what is inside you might open it said pandora looking sideways at epimetheus and then we could see for ourselves pandora what are you thinking of exclaimed epimetheus and his face expressed so much horror at the idea of looking into a box which had been confided to him on the condition of his never opening it that pandora thought it best not to suggest it any more still however she could not help thinking and talking about the box at least said she you can tell me how it came here it was just left at the door replied epimetheus just before you came by a person who looked very smiling and intelligent and who could hardly forbear laughing as he put it down he was dressed in an odd kind of cloak and had on a cap that seemed to be made partly of feathers so that it looked almost as if it had wings what sort of a staff had he asked pandora oh the most curious staff you ever saw cried epimetheus it was like two serpents twisting around a stick and was carved so naturally that i at first thought the serpents were alive i know him said pandora thoughtfully nobody else has such a staff it was quicksilver and he brought me hither as well as the box no doubt he intended it for me and most probably it contains pretty dresses for me to wear or toys for you and me to play with or something very nice for us both to eat perhaps so answered epimetheus turning away but until quicksilver comes back and tells us so we have neither of us any right to lift the lid of the box what a dull boy he is muttered pandora as epimetheus left the cottage i do wish he had a little more enterprise for the first time since her arrival epimetheus had gone out without asking pandora to accompany him he went to gather figs and grapes by himself or to seek whatever amusement he could find in other society than his little playfellows he was tired to death of hearing about the box and heartily wished that quicksilver or whatever was the messenger's name had left it at some other child's door where pandora would never have set eyes on it so perseveringly as she did babble about this one thing the box the box and nothing but the box it seemed as if the box were bewitched and as if the cottage were not big enough to hold it without pandora's continually stumbling over it and making epimetheus stumble over it likewise and bruising all four of their shins well it was really hard that poor epimetheus should have a box in his ears from morning till night especially as the little people of the earth were so unaccustomed to vexations in those happy days that they knew not how to deal with them thus a small vexation made as much disturbance then as a far bigger one would in our own times after epimetheus was gone pandora stood gazing at the box she had called it ugly above a hundred times but in spite of all that she had said against it it was positively a very handsome article of furniture and would have been quite an ornament to any room in which it should be placed it was made of a beautiful kind of wood with dark and rich veins spreading over its surface which was so highly polished that little pandora could see her face in it as the child had no other looking-glass it is odd that she did not value the box merely on this account the edges and corners of the box were carved with most wonderful skill around the margin there were figures of graceful men and women and the prettiest children ever seen reclining or sporting amid a profusion of flowers and foliage and these various objects were so exquisitely represented and were wrought together in such harmony that flowers foliage and human beings seemed to combine into a wreath of mingled beauty but here and there peeping forth from behind the carved foliage pandora once or twice fancied that she saw a face not so lovely or something or other that was disagreeable and which stole the beauty out of all the rest nevertheless on looking more closely and touching the spot with her finger she could discover nothing of the kind some face that was really beautiful had been made to look ugly by her catching a sideways glimpse at it 
The most beautiful face of all was done in what was called high relief, in the center of the lid. There was nothing else, save the dark, smooth richness of the polished wood, and this one face in the center, with a garland of flowers about its brow. Pandora had looked at this face a great many times, and imagined that the mouth could smile if it liked, or be grave when it chose, the same as any living mouth. The features, indeed, all wore a very lively and rather mischievous expression, which looked almost as if it needs must burst out of the carved lips, and utter itself in words. Had the mouth spoken, it would probably have been something like this. Do not be afraid, Pandora. What harm can there be in opening the box? Never mind that poor, simple Epimetheus. You are wiser than he, and have ten times as much spirit. Open the box, and see if you do not find something very pretty. The box, I had almost forgotten to say, was fastened, not by a lock, nor by any other such contrivance, but by a very intricate knot of gold cord. There appeared to be no end to this knot and no beginning. Never was a knot so cunningly twisted, nor with so many ins and outs, which roguishly defied the skillfulest fingers to disentangle them. And yet, by the very difficulty that there was in it, Pandora was the more tempted to examine the knot, and just see how it was made. Two or three times already she had stooped over the box, and taken the knot between her thumb and forefinger, but without positively trying to undo it. I really believe, said she to herself, that I begin to see how it was done. Nay, perhaps I could tie it up again after undoing it. There would be no harm in that, surely. Even Epimetheus would not blame me for that. I need not open the box, and should not, of course, without the foolish boy's consent, even if the knot were untied. It might have been better for Pandora, if she had had a little work to do, or anything to employ her mind upon, so as not to be so constantly thinking of this one subject. But children led so easy a life before any troubles came into the world that they had really a great deal too much leisure. They could not be forever playing at hide-and-seek amid the flower shrubs, or at blind man's bluff with garlands over their eyes, or at whatever other games had been found out, while Mother Earth was in her babyhood. When life is all sport, toil is the real play. There was absolutely nothing to do. A little sweeping and dusting about the cottage, I suppose, and the gathering of fresh flowers, which were only too abundant everywhere, and arranging them in vases, and poor little Pandora's day's work was over. And then, for the rest of the day, there was the box. After all, I am not quite sure that the box was not a blessing to her in its way. It supplied her with such a variety of ideas to think of, and to talk about, whenever she had anybody to listen. When she was in good humor, she could almost admire the bright polish of its sides, and the rich border of beautiful faces and foliage that ran all around it. Or, if she chanced to be ill-tempered, she could give it a push, or kick it with her naughty little foot. And many a kick did the box. But it was a mischievous box, as we shall see, and deserved all it got. Many a kick did it receive. But, certain it is, if it had not been for the box, our active-minded little Pandora would not have known half so well how to spend her time as she now did. For it was really an endless employment to guess what was inside. What could it be indeed? Just imagine, my little hearers, how busy your wits would be if there were a great box in the house, which, as you might have reason to suppose, contained something new and pretty for your Christmas or New Year's gifts. Do you think that you should be less curious than Pandora? If you were left alone with the box, might you not feel a little tempted to lift the lid? But you would not do it. Oh, fie, no, no. Only, if you thought there were toys in it, it would be so very hard to let slip an opportunity of taking just one peep. I know not whether Pandora expected any toys, for none had yet begun to be made, probably in those days when the world itself was one great plaything for the children that dwelt upon it. But Pandora was convinced that there was something very beautiful and valuable in the box, and therefore she felt just as anxious to take a peep as any of these little girls here around me would have felt. And possibly a little more so. 
but of that I am not quite so certain. On this particular day, however, which we have so long been talking about, her curiosity grew so much greater than it usually was, that, at last, she approached the box. She was more than half determined to open it, if she could. Ah, naughty Pandora! First, however, she tried to lift it. It was heavy, quite too heavy for the slender strength of a child like Pandora. She raised one end of the box a few inches from the floor, and let it fall again with a pretty loud thump. A moment afterwards, she almost fancied that she heard something stir inside of the box. She applied her ear as closely as possible, and listened. Positively, there did seem to be a kind of stifled murmur within. Or was it merely the singing in Pandora's ears? Or could it be the beating of her heart? The child could not quite satisfy herself whether she had heard anything or no. But, at all events, her curiosity was stronger than ever. As she drew back her head, her eyes fell upon the knot of gold cord. "'It must have been a very ingenious person who tied this knot,' said Pandora to herself. "'But I think I could untie it nevertheless. I am resolved at least to find the two ends of the cord.' So she took the golden knot in her fingers, and pried into its intricacies as sharply as she could. Almost without intending it, or quite knowing what she was about, she was soon busily engaged in attempting to undo it. Meanwhile, the bright sunshine came through the open window, as did likewise the merry voices of the children, playing at a distance, and perhaps the voices of Epimetheus among them. Pandora stopped to listen. What a beautiful day it was! Would it not be wiser, if she were to let the troublesome knot alone, and think no more about the box? but run and join her little playfellows, and be happy. All this time, however, her fingers were half unconsciously busy with the knot, and happening to glance at the flower-wreathed face on the lid of the enchanted box, she seemed to perceive it slyly grinning at her. That face looks very mischievous, thought Pandora. I wonder whether it smiles because I am doing wrong. I have the greatest mind in the world to run away. But just then, by the merest accident, she gave the knot a kind of a twist, which produced a wonderful result. The gold cord untwined itself, as if by magic, and left the box without a fastening. "'This is the strangest thing I ever knew,' said Pandora. "'What will Epimetheus say, and how can I possibly tie it up again?' She made one or two attempts to restore the knot, but soon found it quite beyond her skill. It had disentangled itself so suddenly that she could not in the least remember how the strings had been doubled into one another, and when she tried to recollect the shape and appearance of the knot, it seemed to have gone entirely out of her mind. Nothing was to be done, therefore, but to let the box remain as it was until Epimetheus should come in. But, said Pandora, when he finds the knot untied, he will know that I have done it. How shall I make him believe that I have not looked into the box? And then the thought came into her naughty little heart, that, since she would be suspected of having looked into the box, she might just as well do so at once. Oh, very naughty and very foolish Pandora! You should have thought only of doing what was right and of leaving undone what was wrong, and not of what your playfellow Epimetheus would have said or believed. And so perhaps she might, if the enchanted face on the lid of the box had not looked so bewitchingly persuasive at her, and if she had not seemed to hear, more distinctly than before, the murmur of small voices within. She could not tell whether it was fancy or no, but there was quite a little tumult of whispers in her ear or else it was her curiosity that whispered. Let us out, dear Pandora, pray let us out. We will be such nice, pretty playfellows for you. Only let us out. What can it be? thought Pandora. Is there something alive in the box? Well, yes, I am resolved to take just one peep. Only one peep, and then the lid shall be shut down as safely as ever. There cannot possibly be any harm in just one little peep but it is now time for us to see what Epimetheus was doing. This was the first time since his little playmate had come to dwell with him that he had attempted to enjoy any pleasure in which she did not partake. 
but nothing went right, nor was he nearly so happy as on other days. He could not find a sweet grape or a ripe fig. If Epimetheus had a fault, it was a little too much fondness for figs. Or, if ripe at all, they were overripe, and so sweet as to be cloying. There was no mirth in his heart, such as usually made his voice gush out of its own accord and swell the merriment of his companions. In short, he grew so uneasy and discontented that the other children could not imagine what was the matter with Epimetheus. Neither did he himself know what ailed him, any better than they did. For you must recollect that, at the time we are speaking of, it was everybody's nature, in constant habit, to be happy. The world had not yet learned to be otherwise. Not a single soul or body, since these children were first sent to enjoy themselves on the beautiful earth, had ever been sick or out of sorts. At length, discovering that, somehow or other, he put a stop to all the play, Epimetheus judged it best to go back to Pandora, who was in a humor better suited to his own. But, with a hope of giving her pleasure, he gathered some flowers and made them into a wreath which he meant to put upon her head. The flowers were very lovely, roses and lilies and orange blossoms, and a great many more, which left a trail of fragrance behind, as Epimetheus carried them along, and the wreath was put together with as much skill as could reasonably be expected of a boy. The fingers of little girls, it has always appeared to me, are the fittest to twine flower wreaths, but boys could do it, in those days, rather better than they can now. And here I must mention that a great black cloud had been gathering in the sky for some time past, although it had not yet overspread the sun. But, just as Epimetheus reached the cottage door, this cloud began to intercept the sunshine, and thus to make a sudden and sad obscurity. He entered softly, for he meant, if possible, to steal behind Pandora and fling the wreath of flowers over her head, before she should be aware of his approach. But, as it happened, there was no need of his treading so very lightly. He might have trod as heavily as he pleased, as heavily as a grown man, as heavily, I was going to say, as an elephant, without much probability of Pandora's hearing his footsteps. She was too intent upon her purpose. At the moment of his entering the cottage, the naughty child had put her hand to the lid, and was on the point of opening the mysterious box. Epimetheus beheld her. If he had cried out, Pandora would probably have withdrawn her hand, and the fatal mystery of the box might never have been known. But Epimetheus himself, although he said very little about it, had his own share of curiosity to know what was inside. Perceiving that Pandora was resolved to find out the secret, he determined that his playfellow should not be the only wise person in the cottage. And if there were anything pretty or valuable in the box, he meant to take half of it to himself. Thus, after all his sage speeches to Pandora about restraining her curiosity, Epimetheus turned out to be quite as foolish, and nearly as much in fault, as she. So, whenever we blame Pandora for what happened, we must not forget to shake our heads at Epimetheus likewise. As Pandora raised the lid, the cottage grew very dark and dismal, for the black cloud had now swept quite over the sun, and seemed to have buried it alive. There had, for a little while past, been a low growling and muttering, which all at once broke into a heavy peal of thunder. But Pandora, heeding nothing of all this, lifted the lid nearly upright, and looked inside. It seemed as if a sudden swarm of winged creatures brushed past her, taking flight out of the box, while, at the same instant, she heard the voice of Epimetheus, with a lamentable tone, as if he were in pain. "'Oh, I am stung!' cried he. "'I am stung! Naughty Pandora, why have you opened this wicked box?' Pandora let fall the lid, and, starting up, looked about her to see what had befallen Epimetheus. The thundercloud had so darkened the room that she could not very clearly discern what was in it. But she heard a disagreeable buzzing, 
as of a great many huge flies or gigantic mosquitoes or those insects which we call door bugs and pinching dogs were darting about and as her eyes grew more accustomed to the imperfect light she saw a crowd of ugly little shapes with bats wings looking abominably spiteful and armed with terribly long stings in their tails it was one of these that had stung epimetheus nor was it a great while before pandora herself began to scream in no less pain and affright than her playfellow and making a vast deal more hubbub about it an odious little monster had settled on her forehead and would have stung her i know not how deeply if epimetheus had not run and brushed it away now if you wish to know what these ugly things might be which had made their escape out of the box i must tell you that they were the whole family of earthly troubles there were evil passions there were a great many species of cares there were more than a hundred and fifty sorrows there were diseases in a vast number of miserable and painful shapes there were more kinds of naughtiness than it would be of any use to talk about in short everything that has since afflicted the souls and bodies of mankind had been shut up in the mysterious box and given to epimetheus and pandora to be kept safely in order that the happy children of the world might never be molested by them had they been faithful to their trust all would have gone well no grown person would ever have been sad nor any child have had cause to shed a single tear from that hour until this moment but and you may see by this how a wrong act of any one mortal is a calamity to the whole world by pandora's lifting the lid of that miserable box and by the fault of epimetheus too in not preventing her these troubles have obtained a foothold among us and do not seem very likely to be driven away in a hurry for it was impossible as you will easily guess that the two children should keep the ugly swarm in their own little cottage on the contrary the first thing that they did was to fling open the doors and windows in hopes of getting rid of them and sure enough away flew the winged troubles all abroad and so pestered and tormented the small people everywhere about that none of them so much as smiled for many days afterwards and what was very singular all the flowers and dewy blossoms on earth not one of which had hitherto faded now began to droop and shed their leaves after a day or two the children moreover who before seemed immortal in their childhood now grew older day by day and came soon to be youths and maidens and men and women by and by and aged people before they dreamed of such a thing meanwhile the naughty pandora and hardly less naughty epimetheus remained in their cottage both of them had been grievously stung and were in a good deal of pain which seemed the more intolerable to them because it was the very first pain that had ever been felt since the world began of course they were entirely unaccustomed to it and could have no idea what it meant besides all this they were in exceedingly bad humor both with themselves and with one another in order to indulge it to the utmost epimetheus sat down sullenly in a corner with his back towards pandora while pandora flung herself upon the floor and rested her head on the fatal and abominable box she was crying bitterly and sobbing as if her heart would break suddenly there was a gentle little tap on the inside of the lid what can that be cried pandora lifting her head but either epimetheus had not heard the tap or was too much out of humor to notice it at any rate he made no answer you are very unkind said pandora sobbing anew not to speak to me again the tap it sounded like the tiny knuckles of a fairy's hand knocking lightly and playfully on the inside of the box who are you asked pandora with a little of her former curiosity who are you inside of this naughty box a sweet little voice spoke from within only lift the lid and you shall see no no answered pandora again beginning to sob i have had enough of lifting the lid you are inside of the box naughty creature and there you shall stay 
There are plenty of your ugly brothers and sisters already flying about the world. You need never think that I shall be so foolish as to let you out. She looked towards Epimetheus as she spoke, perhaps expecting that he would commend her for her wisdom. But the sullen boy only muttered that she was wise a little too late. Ah, said the sweet little voice again, you had much better let me out. I am not like those naughty creatures that have stings in their tails. They are no brothers and sisters of mine, as you would see at once, if you were only to get a glimpse of me. Come, come, my pretty Pandora, I am sure you will let me out. And, indeed, there was a kind of cheerful witchery in the tone that made it almost impossible to refuse anything which this little voice asked. Pandora's heart had insensibly grown lighter at every word that came from within the box. Epimetheus, too, though still in the corner, had turned half round and seemed to be in rather better spirits than before. "'My dear Epimetheus,' cried Pandora, "'have you heard this little voice?' "'Yes, to be sure I have,' answered he, "'but in no very good humour as yet. "'And what of it?' "'Shall I lift the lid again?' asked Pandora. "'Just as you please,' said Epimetheus. "'You have done so much mischief already "'that perhaps you may as well do a little more.' One other trouble in such a swarm as you have set adrift about the world can make no very great difference. You might speak a little more kindly, murmured Pandora, wiping her eyes. Ah, naughty boy, cried the little voice within the box in an arch and laughing tone. He knows he is longing to see me. Come, my dear Pandora, lift up the lid. I am in a great hurry to comfort you. Only let me have some fresh air and you shall soon see that matters are not quite so dismal as you think them. Epimetheus, exclaimed Pandora, come what may, I am resolved to open the box. And as the lid seems very heavy, cried Epimetheus, running across the room, I will help you. So, with one consent, the two children again lifted the box. Out flew a sunny and smiling little personage, and hovered about the room, throwing a light wherever she went. Have you ever made the sunshine dance into dark corners by reflecting it from a bit of looking-glass? Well, so looked the winged cheerfulness of this fairy-like stranger amid the gloom of the cottage. She flew to Epimetheus and laid the least touch of her finger on the inflamed spot where the trouble had stung him, and immediately the anguish of it was gone. Then she kissed Pandora on the forehead, and her hurt was cured likewise. After performing these good offices, the bright stranger fluttered sportively over the children's heads, and looked so sweetly at them, that they both began to think it not so very much amiss to have opened the box, since, otherwise, their cheery guest must have been kept a prisoner among those naughty imps with stings in their tails. "'Pray, who are you, beautiful creature?' inquired Pandora. "'I am to be called Hope.' answered the sunshiny figure, and because I am such a cheery little body, I was packed into the box to make amends to the human race for that swarm of ugly troubles which was destined to be let loose among them. Never fear, we shall do pretty well in spite of them all. Your wings are colored like the rainbow, exclaimed Pandora. How very beautiful. Yes, they are like the rainbow, said Hope, because, glad as my nature is, I am partly made of tears, as well as smiles. "'And will you stay with us?' asked Epimetheus. "'Forever and ever?' "'As long as you need me,' said Hope, with her pleasant smile. "'And that will be as long as you live in the world. I promise never to desert you. There may come times and seasons, now and then, when you will think that I have utterly vanished. And again, and again, and again, when perhaps you least dream of it, you shall see the glimmer of my wings on the ceiling of your cottage. Yes, my dear children, and I know something very good and beautiful that is to be given you hereafter. Oh, tell us, they exclaimed, tell us what it is. Do not ask me, replied Hope, putting her finger on her rosy mouth, but do not despair, even if it should never happen while you live on this earth. Trust in my promise, for it is true. We do trust you cried Epimetheus and Pandora, both in one breath. And so they did. 
and not only they but so has everybody trusted hope that has since been alive and to tell you the truth i cannot help being glad although to be sure it was an uncommonly naughty thing for her to do but i cannot help being glad that our foolish pandora peeped into the box no doubt no doubt the troubles are still flying about the world and have increased in multitude rather than lessened and are a very ugly set of imps and carry most venomous stings in their tails i have felt them already and i expect to feel them more as i grow older but then that lovely and lightsome little figure of hope what in the world could we do without her hope spiritualizes the earth hope makes it always new and even in the earth's best and brightest aspect hope shows it to be only the shadow of an infinite bliss hereafter end of section nine Section 10 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Goad. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Tangle with Playroom After the Story. Primrose, asked Eustace, pinching her ear, how do you like my little Pandora? Don't you think her the exact picture of yourself? but you would not have hesitated half so long about opening the box. Then I should have been well punished for my naughtiness, retorted Primrose smartly, for the first thing to pop out after the lid was lifted would have been Mr. Eustace Wright in the shape of a trouble. Cousin Eustace, said Sweet Fern, did the box hold all the trouble that has ever come into the world? Every mite of it, answered Eustace. This very snowstorm which has spoiled my skating was packed up there. And how big was the box? asked Sweet Fern. Why, perhaps three feet long, said Eustace, two feet wide and two feet and a half high. Ah, said the child, you're making fun of me, cousin Eustace. I know there is not enough trouble in the world to fill such a great box as that. As to the snowstorm, it is no trouble at all, but a pleasure, so it could not have been in the box. Hear the child, cried Primrose with an air of superiority. How little he knows about the troubles of this world, poor fellow. He will be wiser when he has seen as much of life as I have. So saying, she began to skip the rope. Meantime, the day was drawing towards its close, out of doors. The scene certainly looked dreary. There was a gray drift, far and wide, through the gathering twilight. The earth was as pathless as the air, and the bank of snow over the steps of the porch proved that nobody had entered or gone out for a good many hours past. Had there been only one child at the window of Tanglewood, gazing at this wintry prospect, it would have perhaps made him sad, but half a dozen children together, though they cannot quite turn the world into a paradise, may defy old winter and all his storms to put them out of spirits. Eustace Bright, moreover, on the spur of the moment, invented several new kinds of play, which kept them all in a roar of merriment till bedtime, and served for the next story day besides. This is the end of section 10. Section 11 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Introductory to the Three Golden Apples. The snowstorm lasted another day, but what became of it afterwards? I cannot possibly imagine. At any rate, it entirely cleared away during the night, and when the sun arose the next morning, it shone brightly down on as bleak a tract of hill country here in Berkshire as could be seen anywhere in the world. The frostwork had so covered the window panes that it was hardly possible to get a glimpse at the scenery outside. But, while waiting for breakfast, the small populace of Tanglewood had scratched peepholes with their fingernails and saw with vast delight that unless it were one or two bare patches on a precipitous hillside or the gray effect of the snow intermingled with the black pine forest all nature was as white as a sheet how exceedingly pleasant and to make it all the better 
it was cold enough to nip one's nose short off. If people have but life enough in them to bear it, there is nothing that so raises the spirits and makes the blood ripple and dance so nimbly like a brook down the slope of a hill as a bright, hard frost. No sooner was breakfast over than the whole party, well muffled in furs and woolens, floundered forth into the midst of the snow. Well, what a day of frosty sport was this! They slid downhill into the valley a hundred times, nobody knows how far, and, to make it all the merrier, upsetting their sledges and tumbling head over heels quite as often as they came safely to the bottom. And once Eustace Bright took Periwinkle, Sweet Fern, and the Squash Blossom on the sledge with him by way of ensuring a safe passage, and down they went, full speed. But, behold, halfway down the sledge hit against a hidden stump and flung all four of its passengers into a heap, and on gathering themselves up, there was no little squash blossom to be found. Why, what could have become of the child? And while they were wondering and staring about, up started squash blossom out of a snowbank, with the reddest face you ever saw, and looking as if a large scarlet flower had suddenly sprouted up in midwinter. Then there was a great laugh. When they had grown tired of sliding downhill, Eustace set the children to digging a cave in the biggest snowdrift that they could find. Unluckily, just as it was completed and the party had squeezed themselves into the hollow, down came the roof upon their heads and buried every soul of them alive. The next moment, up popped all their little heads out of the ruins, and the tall student's head in the midst of them, looking hoary and venerable with the snow dust that had got amongst his brown curls. And then, to punish Cousin Eustace for advising them to dig such a tumble-down cavern, the children attacked him in a body, and so bepelted him with snowballs that he was fain to take to his heels. So we ran away, and went into the woods, and thence to the margin of Shadow Brook, where he could hear the streamlet grumbling along under great overhanging banks of snow and ice, which would scarcely let it see the light of day. There were adamantine icicles glittering around all its little cascades. Thence he strolled to the shore of the lake, and beheld a white, untrodden plain before him, stretching from his own feet to the foot of Monument Mountain. And it being now almost sunset, Eustace thought that he had never beheld anything so fresh and beautiful as the scene. He was glad that the children were not with him, for their lively spirits and tumble-about activity would quite have chased away his higher and graver mood, so that he would merely have been merry, as he had already been, in the whole day long, and would not have known the loveliness of the winter sunset among the hills. When the sun was fairly down, our friend Eustace went home to eat his supper. After the meal was over, he betook himself to the study with a purpose, I rather imagine, to write an ode, or two or three sonnets, or verses of some kind or other, in praise of the purple and golden clouds which he had seen around the setting sun. But, before he had hammered out the very first rhyme, the door opened, and Primrose and Periwinkle made their appearance. "'Go away, children. I can't be troubled with you now,' cried the student." looking over his shoulder with the pen between his fingers. What in the world do you want here? I thought you were all in bed. Hear him, Periwinkle, trying to talk like a grown man, said Primrose, and he seems to forget that I am now thirteen years old and may sit up almost as late as I please. But, Cousin Eustace, you must put off your airs and come with us to the drawing-room. The children have talked so much about your stories that my father wishes to hear one of them, in order to judge whether they are likely to do any mischief. Pooh, pooh, Primrose, exclaimed the student, rather vexed. I don't believe I can tell one of my stories in the presence of grown people. Besides, your father is a classical scholar. Not that I am much afraid of his scholarship, neither, for I doubt not it is as rusty as an old case knife by this time. But then he will be sure to quarrel with the admirable nonsense that I put into these stories out of my own head, and which makes the great charm of the matter for children like yourself. No man of fifty, who has read the classical myths in his youth, 
can possibly understand my merit as a reinventor and improver of them. All this may be very true, said Primrose, but come you must. My father will not open his book, nor will Mama open the piano, till you have given us some of your nonsense, as you very correctly call it. So be a good boy, and come along. Whatever he might pretend, the student was rather glad than otherwise, on second thoughts, to catch at the opportunity of proving to Mr. Pringle what an excellent faculty he had in modernizing the myths of ancient times. Until twenty years of age, a young man may, indeed, be rather bashful about showing his poetry and his prose. But, for all that, he is pretty apt to think that these very productions would place him at the tip-top of literature, if once they could be known. Accordingly, without much more resistance, Eustace suffered Primrose and Periwinkle to drag him into the drawing-room. It was a large, handsome apartment, with a semicircular window at one end, in the recess of which stood a marble copy of Grinnell's Angel and Child. On one side of the fireplace there were many shelves of books, gravely but richly bound. The white light of the astral lamp and the red glow of the bright coal fire made the room brilliant and cheerful, and before the fire, in a deep armchair, sat Mr. Pringle, looking just fit to be seated in such a chair, and in such a room. He was a tall and quite handsome gentleman, with a bald brow, and was always so nicely dressed that even Eustace Bright never liked to enter his presence without at least pausing at the threshold to settle his shirt-collar. But now, as Primrose had hold of one of his hands, and Periwinkle of the other, he was forced to make his appearance with a rough-and-tumble sort of look, as if he had been rolling all day in a snowbank. And so he had. Mr. Pringle turned toward the student benignly enough, but in a way that made him feel how uncombed and unbrushed he was, and how uncombed and unbrushed, likewise, were his mind and thoughts. Eustace, said Mr. Pringle with a smile, I find that you are producing a great sensation among the little public of Tanglewood, by the exercise of your gifts of narrative. Primrose here, as the little folks choose to call her, and the rest of the children, have been so loud in praise of your stories, that Mrs. Pringle and myself are really curious to hear a specimen. It would be so much the more gratifying to myself, as the stories appear to be an attempt to render the fables of classical antiquity into the idiom of modern fancy and feeling. At least, so I judge from a few of the incidents which have come to me at second hand. You are not exactly the auditor that I should have chosen, sir, observed the student, for fantasies of this nature. Possibly not, replied Mr. Pringle. I suspect, however, that a young author's most useful critic is precisely the one whom he would be least apt to choose. Pray oblige me, therefore. Sympathy, methinks, should have some little share in the critic's qualifications, murmured Eustace Bright. However, sir, if you will find patience, I will find stories. But be kind enough to remember that I am addressing myself to the imagination and sympathies of the children, not to your own. Accordingly, the student snatched hold of the first theme which presented itself. It was suggested by a plate of apples that he happened to spy on the mantelpiece. End of section 11、section、12 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Three Golden Apples. Part One. Did you ever hear of the golden apples that grew in the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, those were such apples as would bring a great price by the bushel if any of them could be found growing in the orchards of nowadays. But there is not, I suppose, a graft of that wonderful fruit on a single tree in the wide world. Not so much as a seed of those apples exists any longer. And, even in the old, old, half-forgotten times, before the garden of the Hesperides was overrun with weeds, 
a great many people doubted whether there could be real trees that bore apples of solid gold upon their branches all had heard of them but nobody remembered to have seen any children nevertheless used to listen open-mouthed to stories of the golden apple tree and resolved to discover it when they should be big enough adventurous young men who desired to do a braver thing than any of their fellows set out in quest of this fruit many of them returned no more none of them brought back the apples no wonder that they found it impossible to gather them it is said that there was a dragon beneath the tree with a hundred terrible heads fifty of which were always on the watch while the other fifty slept in my opinion it was hardly worth running so much risk for the sake of a solid golden apple had the apples been sweet mellow and juicy indeed that would have been another matter there might then have been some sense in trying to get at them in spite of the hundred-headed dragon but as i have already told you it was quite a common thing with young persons when tired of too much peace and rest to go in search of the garden of the hesperides and once the adventure was undertaken by a hero who had enjoyed very little peace or rest since he came into the world at the time of which i am going to speak he was wandering through the pleasant land of italy with a mighty club in his hand and a bow and quiver slung across his shoulders he was wrapped in the skin of the biggest and fiercest lion that had ever been seen and which he himself had killed and though on the whole he was kind and generous and noble there was a good deal of the lion's fierceness in his heart as he went on his way he continually inquired whether that were the right road to the famous garden but none of the country people knew anything about the matter and many looked as if they would have laughed at the question if the stranger had not carried so very big a club so he journeyed on and on still making the same inquiry until at last he came to the brink of a river where some beautiful young women sat twining wreaths of flowers can you tell me pretty maidens asked the stranger whether this is the right way to the garden of the hesperides the young women had been having a fine time together weaving the flowers into wreaths and crowning one another's heads and there seemed to be a kind of magic in the touch of their fingers that made the flowers more fresh and dewy and of brighter hues and sweeter fragrance while they played with them than even when they had been growing on their native stems but on hearing the stranger's question they dropped all their flowers on the grass and gazed at him with astonishment the garden of the hesperides cried one we thought mortals had been weary of seeking it after so many disappointments and pray adventurous traveller what do you want there a certain king who is my cousin replied he has ordered me to get him three of the golden apples most of the young men who go in quest of these apples observed another of the damsels desire to obtain them for themselves or to present them to some fair maiden whom they love do you then love this king your cousin so very much perhaps not replied the stranger sighing he has often been severe and cruel to me but it is my destiny to obey him and do you know asked the damsel who had first spoken that a terrible dragon with a hundred heads keeps watch under the golden apple tree i know it well answered the stranger calmly but from my cradle upwards it has been my business and almost my pastime to deal with serpents and dragons the young woman looked at his massive club and at the shaggy lion skin which he wore and likewise at his heroic limbs and figure and they whispered to each other that the stranger appeared to be one who might reasonably expect to perform deeds far beyond the might of other men but then the dragon with a hundred heads what mortal even if he possessed a hundred lives could hope to escape the fangs of such a monster so kind-hearted were the maidens that they could not bear to see this brave and handsome traveller attempt what was so very dangerous and devote himself most probably to become a meal for the dragon's hundred ravenous mouths go back cried they all go back to your own home your mother beholding you safe and sound will shed tears of joy and what can she do more 
should you win ever so great a victory no matter for the golden apples no matter for the king your cruel cousin we do not wish the dragon with the hundred heads to eat you up the stranger seemed to grow impatient at these remonstrances he carelessly lifted his mighty club and let it fall upon a rock that lay half buried in the earth near by with the force of that idle blow the great rock was shattered all to pieces it cost the stranger no more effort to achieve this feat of a giant's strength than for one of the young maidens to touch her sister's rosy cheek with a flower do you not believe said he looking at the damsels with a smile that such a blow would have crushed one of the dragon's hundred heads then he sat down on the grass and told them the story of his life or as much of it as he could remember from the day when he was first cradled in a warrior's brazen shield while he lay there two immense serpents came gliding over the floor and opened their hideous jaws to devour him and he a baby of a few months old had gripped one of the fierce snakes in each of his little fists and strangled them to death when he was but a stripling he had killed a huge lion almost as big as the one whose vast and shaggy hide he now wore upon his shoulders next thing that he had done was to fight a battle with an ugly sort of monster called a hydra which had no less than nine heads and exceedingly sharp teeth in every one but the dragon of the Hesperides, you know observed one of the damsels has a hundred heads nevertheless replied the stranger i would rather fight two such dragons than a single hydra for as fast as i cut off a head two others grew in its place and besides there was one of the heads that could not possibly be killed but kept biting as fiercely as ever long after it was cut off so i was forced to bury it under a stone where it is doubtless alive to this very day but the hydra's body and its eight other heads will never do any further mischief the damsels judging that the story was likely to last a good while had been preparing a repast of bread and grapes that the stranger might refresh himself in the intervals of his talk they took pleasure in helping him to this simple food and now and then one of them would put a sweet grape between her rosy lips lest it should make him bashful to eat alone the traveller proceeded to tell how he had chased a very swift stag for a twelvemonth together without ever stopping to take breath and had at last caught it by the antlers and carried it home alive and he had fought with a very odd race of people half horses and half men and had put them all to death from a sense of duty in order that their ugly figures might never be seen any more besides all this he took to himself great credit for having cleaned out a stable do you call that a wonderful exploit asked one of the young maidens with a smile any clown in the country has done as much had it been an ordinary stable replied the stranger i should not have mentioned it but this was so gigantic a task that it would have taken me all my life to perform it if i had not luckily thought of turning the channel of a river through the stable door that did the business in a very short time seeing how earnestly his fair auditors listened he next told them how he had shot some monstrous birds and had caught a wild bull alive and let him go again and had tamed a number of very wild horses and had conquered hippolyta the warlike queen of the amazons he mentioned likewise that he had taken off hippolyta's enchanted girdle and had given it to the daughter of his cousin the king was it the girdle of venus inquired the prettiest of the damsels which makes women beautiful no answered the stranger it had formerly been the sword belt of mars and it can only make the wearer valiant and courageous an old sword belt cried the damsel tossing her head then i should not care about having it you are right said the stranger going on with his wonderful narrative he informed the maidens that as strange an adventure as ever happened was when he fought with gerion the six-legged man this was a very odd and frightful sort of figure as you may well believe any person looking at his tracks in the sand or snow would suppose that three sociable companions had been walking along together on hearing his footsteps at a little distance it was no more than reasonable to judge that several people must be coming 
but it was only the strange man Jerion, clattering onward with his six legs. Six legs and one gigantic body. Certainly he must have been a very queer monster to look at. And, my stars, what a waste of shoe leather. When the stranger had finished the story of his adventures, he looked around at the attentive faces of the maidens. Perhaps you may have heard of me before, said he, modestly. My name is Hercules. We had already guessed it, replied the maidens, for your wonderful deeds are known all over the world. We do not think it strange any longer that you should set out in quest of the golden apples of the Hesperides. Come, sisters, let us crown the hero with flowers. Then they flung beautiful wreaths over his stately head and mighty shoulders, so that the lion's skin was almost entirely covered with roses. They took possession of his ponderous club, and so entwined it about with the brightest, softest, and most fragrant blossoms, that not a finger's breadth of its oaken substance could be seen. It looked all like a huge bunch of flowers. Lastly, they joined hands and danced around him, chanting words which became poetry of their own accord, and grew into a choral song in honor of the illustrious Hercules. And Hercules was rejoiced as any other hero would have been, to know that these fair young girls had heard of the valiant deeds which it had cost him so much toil and danger to achieve. But still, he was not satisfied. He could not think that what he had already done was worthy of so much honor, while there remained any bold or difficult adventures to be undertaken. Dear maidens, said he, when they paused to take breath, now that you know my name, will you not tell me how I am to reach the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, must you go so soon? they exclaimed. You that have performed so many wonders and spent such a toilsome life. Cannot you content yourself to repose a little while in the margin of this peaceful river? Hercules shook his head. I must depart now, said he. We will then give you the best directions we can, replied the damsels. You must go to the seashore and find out the old one and compel him to inform you where the golden apples are to be found. The old one? repeated Hercules, laughing at this odd name. And pray, who may the old one be? Why, the old man of the sea, to be sure, answered one of the damsels. He has fifty daughters, whom some people call very beautiful, but we do not think it proper to be acquainted with them, because they have sea-green hair and taper away like fishes. You must talk with this old man of the sea. He is a seafaring person, and knows all about the Garden of the Hesperides for it is situated on an island which he is often in the habit of visiting. Hercules then asked whereabouts the old one was most likely to be met with. When the damsels had informed him, he thanked them for all their kindness, for the bread and the grapes with which they had fed him, the lovely flowers with which they had crowned him, and the songs and dances wherewith they had done him honor, and he thanked them most of all for telling him the right way, and immediately set forth upon his journey. But before he was out of hearing, one of the maidens called after him. Keep fast hold of the old one when you catch him, cried she, smiling and lifting her finger to make the caution more impressive. Do not be astonished at anything that may happen. Only hold him fast, and he will tell you what you wish to know. Hercules again thanked her, and pursued his way, while the maidens resumed their pleasant labor of making flower wreaths. They talked about the hero long after he was gone. We will crown him with the loveliest of our garlands, said they, when he returns hither with the three golden apples, after slaying the dragon with a hundred heads. Meanwhile, Hercules traveled constantly onward, over hill and dale, and through the solitary woods. Sometimes he swung his club aloft, and splintered a mighty oak with a downright blow. His mind was so full of the giants and monsters with whom it was the business of his life to fight that perhaps he mistook the great tree for a giant or a monster. And so eager was Hercules to achieve what he had undertaken that he almost regretted to have spent so much time with the damsels, wasting idle breath upon the story of his adventures. But thus it always is with the persons who are destined to perform great things. What they have already done seems less than nothing. What they have taken in hand to do seems worth toil, danger, and life itself. 
persons who happened to be passing through the forest must have been affrighted to see him smite the trees with his great club with but a single blow the trunk was riven as by the stroke of lightning and the broad boughs came rustling and crashing down hastening forward without ever pausing or looking behind he by and by heard the sea roaring at a distance at this sound he increased his speed and soon came to a beach where the great surf waves tumbled themselves upon the hard sand in a long line of snowy foam at one end of the beach however there was a pleasant spot where some green shrubbery clambered up a cliff making its rocky face look soft and beautiful a carpet of verdant grass largely intermixed with sweet-smelling clover covered the narrow space between the bottom of the cliff and the sea and what should hercules espy there but an old man fast asleep but was it really and truly an old man certainly at first sight it looked very like one but on closer inspection it rather seemed to be some kind of a creature that lived in the sea for on his legs and arms there were scales such as fishes have he was web-footed and web-fingered after the fashion of a duck and his long beard being of a greenish tinge had more the appearance of a tuft of seaweed than of an ordinary beard have you never seen a stick of timber that has been long tossed about by the waves and has got all overgrown with barnacles and at last drifting ashore seems to have been thrown up from the very deepest bottom of the sea well the old man would have put you in mind of just such a wave-tossed spar but hercules the instant he set eyes on this strange figure was convinced that it could be no other than the old one who was to direct him on his way yes it was the self-same old man of the sea whom the hospitable maidens had talked to him about thanking his stars for the lucky accident of finding the old fellow asleep hercules stole on tiptoe towards him and caught him by the arm and leg tell me cried he before the old man was well awake which is the way to the garden of the hesperides end of section twelve Section 13 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The Three Golden Apples, Part 2. As you may easily imagine, the old man of the sea awoke in a fright but his astonishment could hardly have been greater than that of hercules the next moment for all of a sudden the old one seemed to disappear out of his grasp and he found himself holding a stag by the fore and hind leg but still he kept his fast hold then the stag disappeared and in its stead there was a sea-bird fluttering and screaming while hercules clutched it by the wing and claw but the bird could not get away immediately afterwards there was an ugly three-headed dog which growled and barked at hercules and snapped fiercely at the hands by which he held him but hercules would not let him go in another minute instead of the three-headed dog what should appear but geryon the six-legged man monster kicking at hercules with five of his legs in order to get the remaining one at liberty but hercules held on by and by no geryon was there but a huge snake like one of those which hercules had strangled in his babyhood only a hundred times as big and it twisted and twined about the hero's neck and body and threw its tail high into the air and opened its deadly jaws as if to devour him outright so that it was really a very terrible spectacle but hercules was no whit disheartened and squeezed the great snake so tightly that he soon began to hiss with pain you must understand that the old man of the sea though he generally looked so much like the wave-beaten figurehead of a vessel had the power of assuming any shape he pleased when he found himself so roughly seized by hercules he had been in hopes of putting him into such surprise and terror by these magical transformations that the hero would be glad to let him go if hercules had relaxed his grasp the old one would certainly have plunged down to the very bottom of the sea whence he would not soon have given himself the trouble of coming up in order to answer any impertinent questions 
ninety-nine people out of a hundred, I suppose, would have been frightened out of their wits by the very first of his ugly shapes, and would have taken to their heels at once. For one of the hardest things in this world is to see the difference between real dangers and imaginary ones. But, as Hercules held on so stubbornly, and only squeezed the old one so much the tighter at every change of shape, and really put him in no small torture, he finally thought it best to reappear in his own figure. So there he was again, a fishy, scaly, web-footed sort of personage, with something like a tuft of seaweed at his chin. "'Pray, what do you want with me?' cried the old one, as soon as he could take breath for it is quite a tiresome affair to go through so many false shapes. Why do you squeeze me so hard? Let me go this moment, or I shall begin to consider you an extremely uncivil person. My name is Hercules, roared the mighty stranger, and you will never get out of my clutch until you tell me the nearest way to the garden of the Hesperides. When the old fellow heard who it was that had caught him, he saw, with half an eye, that it would be necessary to tell him everything that he wanted to know. The old one was an inhabitant of the sea, you must recollect, and roamed about everywhere, like other seafaring people. Of course he had often heard of the fame of Hercules, and of the wonderful things that he was constantly performing in various parts of the earth, and how determined he always was to accomplish whatever he undertook. He therefore made no more attempts to escape, but told the hero how to find the garden of the Hesperides, and likewise warned him of many difficulties which must be overcome before he could arrive thither. "'You must go on thus and thus,' said the old man of the sea, after taking the points of the compass, "'till you come inside of a very tall giant, who holds the sky on his shoulders, and the giant, if he happens to be in the humor, will tell you exactly where the garden of the Hesperides lies.' "'And if the giant happens not to be in the humor?' remarked Hercules, balancing his club on the tip of his finger. "'Perhaps I shall find means to persuade him.' Thanking the old man of the sea, and begging his pardon for having squeezed him so roughly, the hero resumed his journey. He met with a great many strange adventures, which would be well worth your hearing, if I had leisure to narrate them as minutely as they deserve. It was in this journey if I mistake not, that he encountered a prodigious giant, who was so wonderfully contrived by nature, that every time he touched the earth he became ten times as strong as ever he had been before. His name was Antaeus. You may see, plainly enough, that it was a very difficult business to fight with such a fellow, for, as often as he got a knockdown blow, up he started again, stronger, fiercer, and abler to use his weapons than if his enemy had let him alone. Thus, the harder Hercules pounded the giant with his club, the further he seemed from winning the victory. I have sometimes argued with such people, but never fought with one. The only way in which Hercules found it possible to finish the battle was by lifting Antaeus off his feet into the air and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing him until finally the strength was quite squeezed out of his enormous body. When this affair was finished, Hercules continued his travels and went to the land of Egypt, where he was taken prisoner and would have been put to death if he had not slain the king of the country and made his escape. Passing through the deserts of Africa and going as fast as he could, he arrived at last on the shore of the great ocean. And here, unless he could walk on the crests of the billows, it seemed as if his journey must needs be at an end. Nothing was before him save the foaming, dashing, measureless ocean. But suddenly, as he looked towards the horizon, he saw something a great way off, which he had not seen the moment before. It gleamed very brightly, almost as you may have beheld the round golden disk of the sun when it rises or sets over the edge of the world. It evidently drew nearer, for at every instant this wonderful object became larger and more lustrous. At length it had come so nigh that Hercules discovered it to be an immense cup or bowl, made either of gold or burnished brass. How it had got afloat upon the sea is more than I can tell you. There it was, at all events, rolling on the tumultuous billows which tossed it up and down and heaved their foamy tops against its sides, but without ever throwing their spray over the brim. I have seen many giants in my time, 
thought Hercules, but never one that would need to drink his wine out of a cup like this. And, true enough, what a cup it must have been. It was as large, as large, but, in short, I am afraid to say how immeasurably large it was. To speak within bounds, it was ten times larger than a great mill-wheel, and all of metal as it was, it floated over the heaving surges more lightly than an acorn cup adown the brook. The waves tumbled it onward until it grazed against the shore within a short distance of the spot where Hercules was standing. As soon as this happened, he knew what was to be done, for he had not gone through so many remarkable adventures without learning pretty well how to conduct himself whenever anything came to pass a little out of the common rule. It was just as clear as daylight that this marvelous cup had been set adrift by some unseen power and guided hitherward in order to carry Hercules across the sea on his way to the Garden of the Hesperides. Accordingly, without a moment's delay, he clambered over the brim and slid down on the inside, where, spreading out his lion's skin, he proceeded to take a little repose. He had scarcely rested until now since he bade farewell to the damsels on the margin of the river. The waves dashed with a pleasant and ringing sound against the circumference of the hollow bowl. It rocked lightly to and fro, and the motion was so soothing that it speedily rocked Hercules into an agreeable slumber. His nap had probably lasted a good while, when the cup chanced to graze against a rock, and in consequence immediately resounded and reverberated through its golden or brazen substance a hundred times as loudly as ever you heard a church bell. The noise awoke Hercules, who instantly started up and gazed around him, wondering whereabouts he was. He was not long in discovering that the cup had floated across a great part of the sea, and was approaching the shore of what seemed to be an island. And on that island, what do you think he saw? No, you will never guess it, not if you were to try fifty thousand times. It positively appears to me that this was the most marvelous spectacle that had ever been seen by Hercules in the whole course of his wonderful travels and adventures. It was a greater marvel than the hydra with nine heads, which kept growing twice as fast as they were cut off, greater than the six-legged man-monster, greater than Antaeus, greater than anything that was ever beheld by anybody before or since the days of Hercules, or than anything that remains to be beheld by travelers in all time to come. It was a giant, but such an intolerably big giant, a giant as tall as a mountain, so vast a giant that the clouds rested about his midst like a girdle, and hung like a hoary beard from his chin, and flitted before his huge eyes so that he could neither see Hercules nor the golden cup in which he was voyaging. And, most wonderful of all, the giant held up his great hands and appeared to support the sky, which, so far as Hercules could discern through the clouds, was resting upon his head. This does really seem almost too much to believe. Meanwhile, the bright cup continued to float onward, and finally touched the strand. Just then a breeze wafted across the clouds from before the giant's visage, and Hercules beheld it with all its enormous features, eyes, each of them as big as yonder lake, a nose a mile long, and a mouth of the same width. It was a countenance terrible from its enormity of size, but disconsolate and weary, even as you may see the faces of many people nowadays, who are compelled to sustain burdens above their strength. What the sky was to the giant, such are the cares of the earth to those who let themselves be weighed down by them. And whenever men undertake what is beyond the just measure of their abilities, they encounter precisely such a doom as had befallen this poor giant. Poor fellow! He had evidently stood there a long while. An ancient forest had been growing and decaying around his feet, and oak trees of six or seven centuries old had sprung from the acorn and forced themselves between his toes. The giant now looked down from the far height of his great eyes, and, perceiving Hercules, roared out in a voice that resembled thunder proceeding out of the cloud that had just flitted away from his face. "'Who are you down at my feet there?' And whence do you come in that little cup? I am Hercules, 
thundered back the hero in a voice pretty nearly or quite as loud as the giant's own. And I am seeking for the garden of the Hesperides. Ho, 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 roared the giant in a fit of immense laughter. That is a wise adventure, truly. And why not? cried Hercules, getting a little angry at the giant's mirth. Do you think I am afraid of the dragon with a hundred heads? Just at this time, while they were talking together, some black clouds gathered about the giant's middle, and burst into a tremendous storm of thunder and lightning, causing such a pother that Hercules found it impossible to distinguish a word. Only the giant's immeasurable legs were to be seen, standing up into the obscurity of the tempest, and, now and then, a momentary glimpse of his whole figure, mantled in a volume of mist. He seemed to be speaking most of the time, but his big, deep, rough voice chimed in with the reverberations of the thunderclaps and rolled away over the hills like them. Thus, by talking out of season, the foolish giant expended an incalculable quantity of breath to no purpose, for the thunder spoke quite as intelligibly as he. At last the storm swept over as suddenly as it had come, and there again was the clear sky and the weary giant holding it up, and the pleasant sunshine beaming over his vast height and illuminating it against the background of the sullen thunderclouds. So far above the shower had been his head that not a hair of it was moistened by the raindrops. When the giant could see Hercules still standing on the seashore, he roared out to him anew, I am Atlas, the mightiest giant in the world, and I hold the sky upon my head. So I see, answered Hercules. But can you show me the way to the Garden of the Hesperides? What do you want there? asked the giant. I want three of the golden apples, shouted Hercules, for my cousin the king. There is nobody but myself, quoth the giant, that can go to the Garden of the Hesperides and gather the golden apples. If it were not for this little business of holding up the sky... I would make half a dozen steps across the sea and get them for you. You are very kind, replied Hercules, and cannot you rest the sky upon a mountain? None of them are quite high enough, said Atlas, shaking his head. But if you were to take your stand on the summit of that nearest one, your head would be pretty nearly on a level with mine. You seem to be a fellow of some strength. What if you should take my burden on your shoulders while I do your errand for you? Hercules, as you must be careful to remember, was a remarkably strong man, and though it certainly requires a great deal of muscular power to uphold the sky, yet if any mortal could be supposed capable of such an exploit, he was the one. Nevertheless, it seemed so difficult an undertaking that for the first time in his life he hesitated. "'Is the sky very heavy?' he inquired. "'Why, not particularly so at first, answered the giant, shrugging his shoulders. "'But it gets to be a little birdsome after a thousand years.' "'And how long a time,' asked the hero, "'will it take you to get the golden apples?' "'Oh, that will be done in a few moments,' cried Atlas. "'I shall take ten or fifteen miles at a stride,' and be at the garden and back again before your shoulders begin to ache. Well then, answered Hercules, I will climb the mountain behind you there, and relieve you of your burden. The truth is, Hercules had a kind heart of his own, and considered that he should be doing the giant a favor by allowing him this opportunity for a ramble. And besides, he thought that it would be still more for his own glory, if he could boast of upholding the sky, than merely to do so ordinary a thing as to conquer a dragon with a hundred heads. Accordingly, without more words, the sky was shifted from the shoulders of Atlas and placed upon those of Hercules. When this was safely accomplished, the first thing that the giant did was to stretch himself, and you may imagine what a prodigious spectacle he was then. Next, he slowly lifted one of his feet out of the forest that had grown up around it, then the other. Then, all at once, he began to caper and leap and dance for joy at his freedom, flinging himself nobody knows how high into the air, and floundering down again with a shock that made the earth tremble. Then he laughed, ho, 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 with a thunderous roar that was echoed from the mountains, far and near, 
as if they and the giant had been so many rejoicing brothers. When his joy had a little subsided, he stepped into the sea, ten miles at the first stride, which brought him mid-leg deep, and ten miles at the second, where the water came just above his knees, and ten miles more at the third, by which he was immersed nearly to his waist. This was the greatest depth of the sea. Hercules watched the giant as he still went onward, for it was really a wonderful sight, this immense human form, more than thirty miles off, half hidden by the ocean, but with his upper half as tall and misty and blue as a distant mountain. At last the gigantic shape faded entirely out of view, and now Hercules began to consider what he should do in case Atlas should be drowned in the sea, or if he were to be stung to death by the dragon with a hundred heads which guarded the golden apples at the Hesperides. If any such misfortune were to happen, how could he ever get rid of the sky? And, by the by, its weight began already to be a little irksome to his head and shoulders. I really pity the poor giant, thought Hercules. If it wearies me so much in ten minutes, how must it have wearied him in a thousand years? Oh, my sweet little people, you have no idea what a weight there was in that same blue sky, which looked so soft and aerial above our heads. And there, too, was the bluster of the wind, and the chill in the watery clouds, and the blazing sun, all taking their turns to make Hercules uncomfortable. He began to be afraid that the giant would never come back, he gazed wistfully at the world beneath him, and acknowledged to himself it was a far happier kind of life to be a shepherd at the foot of a mountain than to stand on its dizzy summit and bear up the firmament with his might and mane. For, of course, as you will easily understand, Hercules had an immense responsibility on his mind, as well as a weight on his head and shoulders. Why, if he did not stand perfectly still and keep the sky immovable, the sun would perhaps be put ajar. Or, after nightfall, a great many of the stars might be loosened from their places and shower down, like fiery rain, upon the people's heads. And how ashamed would the hero be if, owing to his unsteadiness beneath its weight, the sky should crack and show a great fissure quite across it. I know not how long it was before, to his unspeakable joy, he beheld the huge shape of the giant, like a cloud on the far-off edge of the sea. At his nearer approach, Atlas held up his hand, in which Hercules could perceive three magnificent golden apples, as big as pumpkins, all hanging from one branch. "'I am glad to see you again,' shouted Hercules, when the giant was within hearing. "'So you have got the golden apples?' "'Certainly, certainly,' answered Atlas. "'And very fair apples they are.' I took the finest that grew on the tree, I assure you. Ah, uh, it is a beautiful spot, that garden of the Hesperides. Yes, and the dragon with a hundred heads is a sight worth any man seeing. After all, you had better have gone for the apples yourself. No matter, replied Hercules. You have had a pleasant ramble, and have done the business as well as I could. I heartily thank you for your trouble. And now, as I have a long way to go, and am rather in haste, and as the king, my cousin, is anxious to receive the golden apples, will you be kind enough to take the sky off my shoulders again? Why, as to that, said the giant, chucking the golden apples into the air twenty miles high or thereabouts, and catching them as they came down, as to that, my good friend, I consider you a little unreasonable. Cannot I carry the golden apples to the king, your cousin, much quicker than you could? As his majesty is in such a hurry to get them, I promise you to take my longest strides. And besides, I have no fancy for burdening myself with the sky just now. Here Hercules grew impatient, and gave a great shrug of his shoulders. It being now twilight, you might have seen two or three stars tumble out of their places. Everybody on earth looked upward in a fright, thinking that the sky might be going to fall next. Oh, that will never do, cried Giant Atlas with a great roar of laughter. I have not let fall so many stars within the last five centuries. By the time you had stood there as long as I did, 
you will begin to learn patience. What? shouted Hercules very wrathfully. Do you intend to make me bear this burden forever? We will see about that one of these days, answered the giant. At all events, you ought not to complain, if you have to bear it for the next hundred years, or perhaps the next thousand. I bore it a good while longer, in spite of the backache. Well, then, after a thousand years, if I happen to feel in the mood, we may possibly shift about again. You are certainly a very strong man, and can never have a better opportunity to prove it. Posterity will talk of you. I warrant it. Pish! A fig for its talk! cried Hercules with another hitch of his shoulders. Just take the sky upon your head, one instant, will you? I want to make a cushion of my lion's skin for the way to rest upon. It really chafes me, and will cause unnecessary inconvenience in so many centuries as I am to stand here. That's no more than fair, and I'll do it, quoth the giant, for he had no unkind feeling towards Hercules, and was merely acting with a too selfish consideration of his own ease. For just five minutes, then, I'll take back the sky. Only for five minutes, recollect. I have no idea of spending another thousand years as I spent the last. Variety is the spice of life, say I. Ah, the thick-witted old rogue of a giant. He threw down the golden apples and received back the sky from the head and shoulders of Hercules upon his own, where it rightly belonged. And Hercules picked up the three golden apples that were as big or bigger than pumpkins, and straightway set out on his journey homeward, without paying the slightest heed to the thundering tones of the giant, who bellowed after him to come back. Another forest sprang up around his feet, and grew ancient there, and again might be seen oak trees of six or seven centuries old, that had waxed such aged between his enormous toes. And there stands the giant to this day, or, at any rate, there stands a mountain as tall as he, in which bears his name, and when the thunder rumbles about its summit, we may imagine it to be the voice of giant Atlas, bellowing after Hercules. End of section 13。section 14 of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. After the Story of the Three Golden Apples. Cousin Eustace, demanded Sweet Fern, who had been sitting at the storyteller's feet with his mouth wide open, exactly how tall was this giant? Oh, Sweet Fern, Sweet Fern, cried the student. Do you think that I was there to measure him with a yardstick? Well, if you must know to a hair's breadth, I suppose he might be from three to fifteen miles straight upward, and that he might have seated himself on Taconic and had Monument Mountain for a footstool. Dear me! ejaculated the good little boy with a contented sort of grunt. That was a giant, sure enough. And how long was his little finger? As long as from Tanglewood to the lake, said Eustace. Sure enough, that was a giant, repeated Sweet Fern, in an ecstasy at the precision of these measurements. And how broad, I wonder, were the shoulders of Hercules? That is what I have never been able to find out, answered the student. But I think they must have been a great deal broader than mine, or than your father's, or than almost any shoulders which one sees nowadays. I wish, whispered Sweet Fern, with his mouth close to the student's ear, that you would tell me how big were some of the oak trees that grew between the giant's toes. They were bigger, said Eustace, than the great chestnut tree which stands beyond Captain Smith's house. Eustace, remarked Mr. Pringle, after some deliberation, I find it impossible to express such an opinion of this story as will be likely to gratify, in the smallest degree, your pride of authorship. Pray, let me advise you never more to meddle with a classical myth. Your imagination is altogether gothic, and will inevitably gothicize everything that you touch. 
The effect is like bedaubing a marble statue with paint. This giant, now. How can you have ventured to thrust his huge, disproportioned mass among the seemly outlines of Grecian fable, the tendency of which is to reduce even the extravagant within limits, by its pervading elegance? I describe the giant as he appeared to me, replied the student, rather piqued. And, sir, if you would only bring your mind into such a relation with these fables as is necessary in order to remodel them, you would see at once that an old Greek had no more exclusive right to them than a modern Yankee has. They are the common property of the world, and of all time. The ancient poets remodeled them at pleasure, and held them plastic in their hands, and why should they not be plastic in my hands as well? Mr. Pringle could not forbear a smile. And besides, continued Eustace, the moment you put any warmth of heart, any passion or affection, any human or divine morality into a classic mold, you make it quite another thing from what it was before. My own opinion is that the Greeks, by taking possession of these legends, which were the immemorial birthright of mankind, and putting them into shapes of indestructible beauty, indeed, but cold and heartless, have done all subsequent ages an incalculable injury. Which you, doubtless, were born to remedy, said Mr. Pringle, laughing outright. Well, well, go on, but take my advice, and never put any of your travesties on paper. And, as your next effort, what if you should try your hand on some one of the legends of Apollo? Ah, sir, you propose it as an impossibility, observed the student, after a moment's meditation. And to be sure, at first thought, the idea of a Gothic Apollo strikes one rather ludicrously. But I will turn over your suggestion in my mind, and do not quite despair of success. During the above discussion, the children, who understood not a word of it, had grown very sleepy, and were now sent off to bed. Their drowsy babble was heard ascending the staircase, while a northwest wind roared loudly among the treetops of Tanglewood, and played an anthem around the house. Eustace Bright went back to the study, and again endeavored to hammer out some verses, but fell asleep between two of the rhymes. End of section 14section fifteen of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michael fascio a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne introductory to the miraculous picture and when and where do you think we find the children next no longer in the winter time but in the merry month of may no longer in Tanglewood Playroom, or at Tanglewood Fireside, but more than halfway up a monstrous hill, or a mountain, as perhaps it would be better pleased to have us call it. They had set out from home with the mighty purpose of climbing this high hill, even to the very tip-top of its bald head. To be sure, it was not quite so high as Chimborazo or Mont Blanc, and was even a good deal lower than old Greylock. But, at any rate, it was higher than a thousand ant hillocks or a million of mole hills, and when measured by the short strides of little children, might be reckoned a very respectable mountain. And was Cousin Eustace with the party? Of that you may be certain, else how could the book go on a step farther? He was now in the middle of the spring vacation, and looked pretty much as we saw him four or five months ago, except that, if you gazed quite closely at his upper lip, you could discern the funniest little bit of a mustache upon it. Setting aside this mark of mature manhood, you might have considered Cousin Eustace just as much a boy as when you first became acquainted with him. He was as merry, as playful, as good-humored, as light of foot and of spirits, and equally a favorite with the little folks, as he had always been. This expedition up the mountain was entirely of his contrivance. All the way up the steep ascent, he had encouraged the elder children with his cheerful voice, and when dandelion, cowslip, and squash blossom grew weary, he had lugged them along, alternately on his back. In this manner, they had passed through the orchards and pastures on the lower part of the hill, and had reached the wood, which extends thence towards its bare summit. The month of May, thus far, had been more amiable than it often is, and this was as sweet and genial a day as the heart of man or child could wish. 
In their progress up the hill, the small people had found enough of violets, blue and white, and some that were as golden as if they had the touch of Midas on them. That sociablest of flowers, the little Houstonia, was very abundant. It is a flower that never lives alone, but which loves its own kind, and is always fond of dwelling with a great many friends and relatives around it. Sometimes you see a family of them, covering a space no bigger than the palm of your hand, and sometimes a large community, whitening a whole tract of pasture, and all keeping one another in cheerful heart and life. With the verge of the wood there were columbines, looking more pale than red, because they were so modest, and had thought proper to seclude themselves too anxiously from the sun. There were wild geraniums, too, and a thousand white blossoms of the strawberry. The trailing arbutus was not quite out of the bloom, but it hid its precious flowers under the last year's withered forest leaves, as carefully as a mother bird hides its little young ones. It knew, I suppose, how beautiful and sweet-scented they were. So cunning was their concealment, that the children sometimes smelt the delicious richness of their perfume, before they knew whence it proceeded. Amid so much life, it was strange and truly pitiful to behold, here and there, in the fields and pastures, the hoary periwigs of dandelions that had already gone to seed. They had done with summer before summer came. With those small globes of winged seeds it was autumn now. Well, but we must not waste our valuable pages with any more talk about the springtime and wildflowers. There is something, we hope, more interesting to be talked about. If you look at the group of children, you may see them all gathered around Eustace Bright, who, sitting on the stump of a tree, seems to be just beginning a story. The fact is, the younger part of the troop have found out that it takes rather too many of their short strides to measure the long ascent of the hill. Cousin Eustace, therefore, has decided to leave sweet fern, cowslip, squash blossom, and dandelion at this point midway up, until the return of the rest of the party from the summit. And because they complain a little, and do not quite like to stay behind, he gives them some apples out of his pocket, and proposes to tell them a very pretty story. Hereupon they brighten up, and change their grieved looks into the broadest kind of smiles. As for the story, I was there to hear it, hidden behind a bush, and shall tell it over to you in the pages that come next. End of chapter 15